right. So, like you said, I'm Greg Becker. I work with Todd Gamblin uh, as well, who uh, worked on these slides a fair amount as well. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how to simplify your containers with SPAC. And since we're talking about containers, I think most of us probably know something about installing software on a supercomputer, but I'm going to give a little recap of how I see that world uh, before I dive into some SPAC stuff. So download maybe 16 tarballs that you need, start building, and you run configure, you run make, it doesn't work, you fight with your compiler for a bit, you figure out exactly what compiler flags you need on your system, you try that, it doesn't work, you realize that you ran configure with the wrong arguments, you change those, you try again, now you need different compiler flags. Somewhere along the way, it finally works, you run make install, you realize you gave configure the wrong prefix and you don't have write permissions there, you do the whole thing over again and get it installed. Something like that. It takes somewhere from an hour to three weeks. And you have no idea when you start how long it's going to take. And then you run the code and you get a seg fault. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. What about containers? Containers are a way to avoid a lot of this, right? We can deploy our software in a container and the users don't have to deal with any of that. But we as the people who write containers still have to do all of that to build the container. <laughs> and in addition, using the OS package manager inside of the container can be um, insufficient sometimes. We don't get optimized binaries out of it. We are developing with an OS software stack, which gives us limited control. So I'm going to talk about how we can use SPAC to replace that whole process inside of our container with something that's a lot easier and a lot cleaner for our uh, container uh, build files. Um, on top of that, I thought about adding a slide, but then I realized I would have to get the slides reapproved if I added one, so I'll just talk about it. Um, there was a lot of conversation yesterday about how we need root to build our containers um, because of the requirement to install software inside of it. Well, SPAC is a user space tool for installing software, so we also might be able to use that to get around the requirement of building our containers with root access. So what is SPAC exactly? It's a package manager for HPC. You clone it, as long as you have Python, tar, and curl, it will just work out of the box. You put it in your path with the setup script, and then SPAC install HDF5, and you get HDF5 on your system. And that's not that helpful, right? Lots of package managers can do things like that. The real key to SPAC is that it allows us to build all of these different variants of the same build, different compilers, different MPI implementations, et cetera, exactly what we need. We were talking about MP, uh, open MPI versus MPitch earlier. Um, and it allows all of those installs to live at the same time um, on your system, unlike a typical package manager. So how does this work? If we're going to have all of that power, we need some language to specify what we want to install. The most basic is just, you know, spec install MPI leaks. It's just a package we picked at semi-random for an example. We can specify the version. We can specify the compiler and the compiler version. We can specify build options that are exposed through the package file, uh, which I'll talk about later. Compiler flags targets for cross-compile environments, like uh, this is an example from a Cray machine. And then we can specify all of that information about the dependencies as well. This is a recursive language. These are all optional. Just specify what you know you need, and SPAC will fill in defaults for the rest. So SPAC list shows the available packages. We're well over 3,000 now. SPAC find shows what you have installed. 
And we can see here that we've got several different versions of adeptutils installed, you know, two of them built with GCC 4.8.2. and one built with GCC 447. And these binaries are all built to work regardless of the user environment. We are path everything, so at, at build time, we know what we're building. At run time, we don't necessarily know what we built. So we put in our paths at build time when we know what we're doing uh, so that everything will work. We also generate module files, but you don't have to use them. And if you're using containers and module files, something went terribly wrong. So there's, there's more info we can query about these. We can see you know, how these two different uh, installations of call path differ. I'm going to skip past that. I said I would talk more about the package file later. It's basically just a templated build recipe. Uh, we've got a little bit of a DSL in Python. We give some information about the package, some metadata, the versions, dependencies. And then we have an install method that says, OK, Given all of that information that we already put together, what the user requested, here's how you install it. And this spec object that is passed in to the install method is how we record all of that information. The spec object is the full build provenance of everything that we're building. We model the dependencies as a DAG, and we we take the user spec, we, we looked at that language earlier today, and we, um, we do something that we call uh, concretization that turns that into a, uh, a full specification of everything about the build. And then um, we can install that. We take a hash of that full provenance, and that's the directory that we install to. That's how we let all of these things uh, coexist. I mentioned the R paths earlier. We also have virtual dependencies for things like MPI, right? We depend on MPI. We don't care whether it's open MPI, MPitch, whatever. And then at concretization time, we can, uh, we can fill those in. So I've mentioned concretization already. We take an abstract spec. We take uh, user configured default policies, and then we resolve that into a full set of provenance. Uh, this is basically a SAT solve. Uh, we don't currently use a SAT solve to do it. That's actually in our uh, current roadmap. Um, but, but that's basically what's going on under the hood for SPAC. So it's a way of taking a simple language for saying what we want and installing it on the system. Now. None of that has been very container specific so far, and we'll get there in a second. One of the reasons to use SPAC for this is, is simply the network effects of the, the shared knowledge of how to build things. SPAC has been picking up steam uh, reasonably well in the open source community. This is showing the uh, active sessions on our documentation page around the world, it's basically everywhere now. Um, we've got a fairly active open source community. We merged over 230 pull requests in the month leading up to supercomputing. Now, that's, you know, we, we did a release then, a normal month, probably 40 to 60 pull requests merged in a month. This is not just a Livermore project. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ownership from a lot of places. Todd Gamblin gave a talk at SC15. Um, and you can see sort of starting early 2016 is when it really took off in other communities. And Livermore is not even the most prolific contributor of package files at this point. Um, more lines of code in the packages have been contributed by Argon than by Livermore. Um, and it's not just DOE sites as well. EPFL uh, in Switzerland is the most prolific contributor outside of Livermore uh, to the core functionality. So some more places that are using SPAC, a lot of the DOE sites, it's part of the ECP project, uh, Fermi and CERN. But in addition to the uh, network effects of SPAC, it allows us to write very concise 
container recipes. So one of the recent features that we added to SPAC was an envir was environments, and this is basically a, a manifest and lock model for expressing dependencies of a project. Um, if you're familiar with manifest and lock from Bundler, you, you write the abstract specs that you require in a file. Um, in, in our example, we have a project that needs HDF5, OpenMPI, and libelf, and we don't care what versions, we don't care what build options, we just need those three things. And we have some configurations for our project. That's uh, defaults for the compilers, et cetera. And we can then concretize that uh, total project configuration. We get concrete specs for all, of, all three of these dependencies. And, and then we know exactly what we need to build. This is seeming sort of like what we need for a container. So how would we do that? The SPAC project has uh, published uh, Docker images. Uh, we haven't published Singularity images, but we can run Docker images through Singularity, so great. And we have these images that are, are just the base OS plus a pre-configured SPAC install that you can run. So you, you take that image, you uh, you copy in your requirements and you run SPAC install. That's it. That's your full container build. So we, we've got a different example here. And now you get a container that's built with HDF5 at this particular version, OpenMPI with this particular option turned on, NALU, and you're ready to go. So there's some work we, we're still working on to make this even cleaner. Um, some, some of these things are not container relevant or container specific, right? The Exascale project, we'll probably work with, uh, with Andy on, on getting containers ready. Um, SPAC stacks is more about facility deployment and chaining as well. The architecture specific binaries are the thing I really want to focus on here about the future work. When we build these containers, we need to then know where we can run them. Um, and currently, our provenance model says we're on an x86-64 machine. That's good, but it's not quite sufficient. Um, so we're working on providing automatically optimized builds to the level of, I'm on a Haswell machine. I'm on a Thunder X2 machine. We need those also to know, we need the same information that we need to optimize our builds to know where we can run the same container. So the, the same um, architecture dependency information uh, will be useful for both cases. So that is actually all I've got. So any questions? One here. So I'm not super familiar with spec, but I've been looking into it for like containerization work. Um, it looks like spec does expose the ability to uh, specify if a package is a build time, link, or runtime dependency. Could yes. you maybe talk about the status of that or how it works at all? Um, yeah. So spec started out as a tool for users to install. Uh, what they require and uh, in, in user space. And so the dependency model uh, was mostly for, uh, for generating the module files and for, for what needs to be in which path variables at build time, right? Build dependencies need to be in the, in the path, link dependencies need to be in LD library path, et cetera. Um, one of the things that we are looking at doing going forward is leveraging that same information to do multi-stage builds. I know multi-stage builds aren't in singularity quite yet, um, but one of the things we'll be able to do is, is ditch those build dependencies um, at, in the second stage of the build and get smaller uh, containers coming out of it. 
Is that is that the the goal you were aiming for? <laughs> yeah. So, so the question was, will all of the ECP sites and projects be deploying their software using SPAC? So the, the S&T projects through ECP, the, the, uh, the software tools, are all currently, I believe, required to write SPAC packages as part of their deployment. And the ECP facilities deployment groups are looking at SPAC as the standard way of deploying. That doesn't mean that any particular site will be required to use that. Um, but the SPAC stacks effort uh, that I mentioned up here um, is, is an effort to create something similar to the environments that I discussed where you can write an entire facility deployment of every compiler, every MPI, everything that you build against those from a single file in a really clean way, similar to how the environments would help you write a container. In addition to that, there are then plans to do containerized deployments for ECP, um, leveraging the same spec build recipes, but obviously a, a very different style of deployment. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 